Okay, live. So now maybe maybe you can maybe you can send a link to Joshua and others so they can post them online. I'm gonna try my best to do that too. But do it, do go it. ahead, Hala, you were talking. I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on. Okay. So when the band might travel, I cancelled all the show uh, with Miriam and we decided to talk more about like the victims. Since for the Israelis, when they mentioned the victims of the Palestinians, they said we killed around five, six persons, maybe 14, we are not sure, but we was just going to kill a terrorist from Hamas, as they said. But why they wanna they, they wanna kill like they have all this technology and they can they to kill this one person that they is wanted for them they need to kill another 14 person in the same building by bombing this building with with uh, two rockets from the F-16. This one rocket from the F-16 make the building with the floor. So for them we are numbers. We are not people. We are not humans. They just treat us as nothing. So that's why we decide, me and Miriam, together, to just put the names of the of the victims on the wall of the of the gallery. And then the other place they refused because we was talking about cause. We was talking about something. We was not going to make an entertainment, entertainment art for them. We are not going to please them. We are not going to strip for them. We are going to tell them the story of the lives of the people. And this is more important for me. So if I am a hero, if I am a victim, this means nothing for me. Because what means here, if for, for us, for, for them, for the Israelis, the main, the main problem for them is our existence in our land. For, for them, for us, we believe, we knew, that our existence is our resistance. If we say nothing, if we just like, just keep our life, make our breakfast, enjoy our dinner, enjoy our drinks, enjoy our walks near the wall, this will, this will, this is the big, the big victory for us. For me, I don't want to discuss the history of like from 5,000 or 6,000, but it's clear, it's clear that there was Jewish, Muslims, Christians living next to each other in Palestine. Hatim Ali Abu Nimli from Electronic Intifada, the Israelis that dropped these papers for the Palestinians in Gaza, asked them, them, asking them to cooperate with them. So Ali Abu Nimli, he called the, the, that guy, the who's in the operator, and that guy was talking in Arabic to Ali. And Ali was asking him, where are you from? He said, and Ali asked him, you speak Arabic very well. Uh, are you Palestinian? That guy, he said, yes, I'm Palestinian. But he said, oh, so you are Palestinian, and you work for the Israeli army? He said, but I am Jewish. I born in Palestine. I born under the British mandate. So I am Palestinian, I'm not Israeli. So there is many, many, many Jewish who was born in Palestine, and they are Palestinians. But when Israel colonized the land, it became Israel. So the thing in Golda Meir, the, she was the Prime Minister of Israel. She was saying the Palestinians are not exist. There is they are non-existence. So for for the PLO, when they start the cinema, they start the cinema for resistance. The logo for the first Palestinian Palestine cinema. It was the uh, the the gun combined with the super eight uh, millimeter. So for many for many art is something serious. It's not about politics. It's not about fight. It's about existence. It's about humanity. It's about the sense of humor of the people. And uh, I hope that I get my point. And thank you. Thank you. So, other questions? Um, I mean, we can open up the discussion. You, you had something you wanted to ask me. 
you just please say it loud so it can get on air. I, I can ask a question from Facebook. Oh yeah, go ahead. Why don't we see you too? Okay. Okay, so this is from um, Michael Dola, and this is, uh, I think, a response to Alex, and he says, "I'm wondering what I'm wondering what people make of what seems to me a flattening of this, this of the distinction between rulers and ruled in each country in order to." counter the recent, quote, hostages will be collateral damage, unquote. Justifications, the person, two speakers before Judith discussed. So he's, he's talking about, he's wondering about these hostages rhetoric that Alex was using. And the question is, on what basis would an international solidarity be forged if not along class lines? Alternatives would seem to necessarily rest on some tenuous humanitarian moral or uh, for example, a liberal basis. I can repeat any part of that if you need one, Alex. Could you just uh, repeat uh, the first part? Just uh, the first thing he said, or yeah, yeah is like con like trying to contextualize the question. I can I can read it to here. I can read it. It says, "I'm wondering what people make of what seems to me a flattening of." distinctions between rulers and ruled in each country in, in order to counter the recent hostages will be collateral damage. Justifications. The person, two speakers before uh, Judith discussed, that's Alex. On what basis would an international solidarity be forged if not along the lines of class? Alternative would seem to necessarily rest on some tenuous humanitarian, moral, i.e. liberal basis. So the question, Alex, is sort of like, uh, isn't it better to look at the situation in terms of class, which then will be able to somehow unite people across the, the, across the line from Israel and Palestine, rather than resort to the notions of culture and morality which have a liberal basis? Um, well, I think, um, I guess in responding to the, the first part about flattening, um, and let me know if you have any problem hearing me, but in responding to the first part about the issue of flattening the ruler and the ruled, um, I think one of the uh, one of the thing that, things that I think is important to point out, which comes back to the issue of, of class solidarity across national lines as well, um, is that I don't think there is such an easy distinction always between ruler and ruled. And I think this is particularly salient when we're talking about, um, for example, in the Iranian case, when we're talking about a government that came to power through a popular revolution. Um, it's not always so easy to figure out um, or to draw the lines between elite um, and, let's say, a subjugated populace, for example. And I think this also holds true um, when we're talking about Palestine, when we're talking about, let's say, Hamas and Gaza specifically. Um, is that it, there are these distinctions between ruler and ruled, and the ability to identify these class distinctions, I think, is, uh, um, is difficulty because the relationships are much more complex than that, and, and people's sense of identification um, or their, their embeddedness within the kind of... Um, particularly when we're talking about, once again, in the Iranian and Palestinian cases, when we're talking about situations in which... Um, you know, social services have been mobilized or deployed as part of the political project, um, in which people, uh, for example, in Gaza, really, uh, you know, there isn't so much of a network outside of uh, Hamas's network um, that exists in terms of employment, in terms of um, active participation, in terms of uh, the ability to, to take part in military resistance. Um, is that I, I don't think it's so easy to create these distinctions between an elite, uh, even if, even of course, though there is elite within the Hamas ruling structure in Gaza, um, the, it isn't that there is a population that's subjugated and, and a ruling elite from Hamas that, that has no relationship to the population itself. Um, and this, I mean, this of course complicates our efforts to, to try and have any kind of international solidarity when, when we recognize that, you know, grassroots uh, um, support or grassroots um, 
relationships to you know to the rule or to self governance um, doesn't always fit easily into this uh, into this way that we can establish um, solidarity that we feel really great about and like that's the the point. But I mean, um, and, and given but, that, that, but you know, but you know, this point has been made by others, and actually, I think if if we have Ross here, Ross is one of the biggest biggest advocates of the only the only viable future for for like getting out of this this situation that's been going on for so long is actually a, a, a form of a form of coalition between 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 the dispossessed of the two sides because Israeli society has been on a on a on a new liberal uh, trajectory since the 90s and and the only way to change it is to somehow somehow uh, highlight what's happening that is common common between the two and if we if if at least most of us agree that the one state solution is the way to go forward it will become even more important to advocate for a type of uh, type of like a class solidarity that will then that would then facilitate this sort of like one state. And I guess we get Ross too. So you want you want to talk, Ross? Okay. Uh, you, you're on because uh, because Tony will change all the screens for the people over there. This is for okay. here. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, what 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 Mo was just talking about the idea of. Um, Having some kind of uh, solidarity between the working class of Gaza, uh, the Palestinians there, and the Israeli national working class, which obviously is not exclusive, exclusively Jewish, exclusively Christian, or Arab. Uh, so, I mean, if I can, just to bring it back to some of the the points in the brief and some of the central themes of fixing the future. Um, with, with this uh, discussion, the dialectic of, of civilization and barbarism was central. Um, and it, that, the relation of the present, the past, to a kind of possible future that could emerge out of um, the current state of existence um, is really the kind of central uh, problem that, that this whole series seems to be trying to address. Um, just a couple days ago, or yesterday actually, um, was the uh, centennial of uh, the declaration of war um, of World War I. Um, Rosa Luxemburg uh, famously stated that uh, from since uh, August 4th, 1914, uh, German social democracy has been a stinking corpse. And obviously anybody who's studied, I mean I'm not trying to relativize or diminish the, the, the loss of human life that's going on now, um, that has been going on these last few months, um, by, by, by just putting it up as a kind of like sheer body count, which, I mean, World War I, the amount of lives lost just dwarfs this. Not, not, to, not to diminish it, but I mean, politically and historically, the present situation, the kind of national impasse uh, that exists in the Middle East, is largely a result of the breakup of multinational empires that took place uh, as a result of World War One. Uh, not just the Ottoman Empire, which is where uh, the territory of Palestine, Israel, uh, emerged out of, but also Aust the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire. Um, a big part of that whole debate was between Luxembourg and Lenin was this idea of national liberation. What is the basis, the class basis on which um, peoples, the working classes of different nations can govern themselves, can, can collaboratively, internationally support one another. To get back to, to, get back to uh, the point that, that uh, Michael was trying to, to raise, the question, um, I mean if we take seriously the, 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 the famous question that Luxembourg asked at the end of World War I, during the revolution in Germany uh, that, that faced a sort of stark choice between socialism or barbarism. If she was saying that, you know, from this moment 
we, we have to decide. It's either going to be socialism or barbarism. We have to accept that in the, in, in the light of, if we, if, we, if we all accept that socialism did not come to pass a hundred years ago, roughly, then we have to accept the, the idea that the alternative is what actually came to pass, that we've been living in a, a sort of barbarism for the last century or so. And part of that, crucially, is the sort of diminishing expectations of a kind of radically different future that could emerge out of the present. Um, and in fact, you know, obviously, you know, the West, different nations like to have, Israel likes to have pretensions to, you know, being a civilized and cultured people who, you know, has concerns for human life which, you know, Orientals and others do not have. I mean, this is an obvious farce, but, I mean, if we accept the idea that we're living in a condition of universal barbarism, um, we have to we have to take seriously then this idea that the kind of destruction of of um, Israel seems to have a kind of contempt for any kind of uh, cultural consideration, international legal consideration. Um, if they claim that bombs are beneath some sort of historic monument, um, they they will decimate it without without thinking twice. Um, whether or not this violence is explicitly predicated on the, the existence of Gazans as a surplus population, which, I mean, they are definitionally. Uh, one of the results after the first intifada was that um, Israel really, you know, it realized how dependent uh, it was on the workforce, the Arab workforce from uh, Palestine, the stateless population. Um, since then, it's largely replaced that workforce with Eastern Europeans and Africans, which actually makes the situation of Gazans much worse because they don't have labor that they could withhold from uh, Israel. They can't. They can't leverage that. Um, in the case of Mosul, um, it was discussed earlier the the, de the um, detonation of uh, the the tomb of the prophet uh, Jonah. Uh, I'm not sure whether the violence that we're seeing in the Middle East universally is relate, it relates to surplus population. In the case of Gaza, I would say almost certainly. Um, but with Mosul and other other places like that uh, in Syria, uh, spilling over into Lebanon as of uh, this last weekend, um, it just seems to be more related to power vacuums that open up and ISIS you know, enters in um, and sort of takes over, rather than this very bizarre um, state of captivity in which Gazans have been, you know, effectively crowded for the last uh, 40 years. Um, in terms of moving forward, I mean, the, the question Can of I international solidarity... to some of those points? What's that? Can I, can I just uh, maybe respond to some of the points? Oh, yeah. Or I, or I just, oh, still those populations. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, while I'm... I mean, anyone else, feel free to jump in as well. Um, but while I'm completely sympathetic to the aims uh, and goals you're speaking of, um, the I am... A, I mean, I'm a little bit confused when I, when I hear... I mean, even the term Gaza proletariat or the proletariat in Gaza. I mean, as we both... To know, as, as you just suggested, as you just pointed out, um, I mean, Gazans are a captive population. They're 90% aid dependent. Uh, the economy has been systematically dismantled over the last eight years. There's no proletariat in Gaza to speak of. I mean, it's, it, we, it, it's difficult to have that conversation about class solidarity when, when an entire economy has been completely dismantled and wiped out. Um, and I think in terms of, I mean, and you have a, a very, very different but also similar in many ways uh, situation in the West Bank where you have a, a largely agricultural population which has been over the course of 40 years systemically kicked off of the land and been kind of pushed into um, you know urban areas, these kind of islands, this forced urbanization that the Israeli occupation has done um, without any concurrent economic development of the, so uh, of the sort that, that you're speaking. I mean you have this, the growth of a service industry that once again is aid dependent. Um, and and while and as I said, while I'm sympathetic to the discussion of, of class as this, as this unifying factor, I'm incredibly skeptical of the possibility 
um, in this present moment of any kind of discussion of class solidarity between Israelis and Palestinians. One, because of the structural issues I just mentioned regarding Palestine that I think we're all aware of, or sorry, regarding the West Bank and Gaza that I think we're all aware of. But also, secondly, because it's been tried for, for decades, and it's, it's been a part of the discussion for decades. One, in terms of class solidarity. I mean, even two, in terms of racial solidarity, no matter what you think of it. From the 90s onwards, we had this discussion of Mizrahi uh, identity as the bridge between Palestinians and Ashkenazim, and, and this whole new future where there would be a rainbow of Arabic-speaking Jews and non-Jews and non-Arabic-speaking Jews and, you know, etc. Um, that while it did, you know, capture, I think, a lot of our uh, attention for a while and it, it made us very optimistic for, for a good moment and I think it made a lot of Mizrahi and Ashkenazi and Palestinian intellectuals excited for a moment, uh, it also failed completely to capture any of the mainstream uh, Mizrahi uh, outlook in Israel. And as much as I, and I don't mean to diminish the work uh, of a number of, am of amazing uh, Mizrahi intellectuals, activists, and artists, um, but I think it's, all, it's important to note that both this kind of cross-cutting racial and class solidarity that, uh, I mean, I, obviously I think we would look more at the class solidarity in terms of our, our, our ideal situation, um, has... I mean, has failed to to materialize spectacularly, um, and and for me, w w I mean, when we talk about solidarity, I'm not necessarily, and we, we can kind of go back and forth on this, um, but my solidarity is very much towards Palestinians under occupation and in a state of captivity, um, and that's what pushes me towards boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It's because of the understanding of the systemic nature of this conflict that that cannot be. Uh, in my opinion, and has, you know, completely over the last 70 years failed to be resolved along any kind of class solidarity lines. And, I mean, we can look at from even before the creation of the State of Israel, for example, in terms of the Hebrew labor movement, which was directly along the lines of what we're speaking right now in terms of the dispossession specifically of Palestinians, um, of the Communist Party in Israel's support for the Declaration of Independence of Israel and their support for, de facto, of the ethnic cleansing of the vast majority of the Palestinian population. Um, and, and the Communist Party's complete failure, for example, to, to discuss that, to atone for those sins, so to speak. Obviously, the Communist Party of Israel is not the, the be-all and end-all of the socialist future or dream of Israel or Palestine. But um, I, I just, for me, I, I, when I hear this, I, I just... You know, I, I just look out my house, uh, sorry, I look out my window and I don't understand where any of this fits into what we're actually dealing with or what Palestinians are actually uh, going through on a daily basis or what they've tried to do in the past for decades on class solidarity or on any other kind of solidarity you want to speak of. Okay, um, okay, you, okay, now, Alex, my question from you is what other category can be constructed in order to, in order to what other universal category can be constructed, even though it's not there, to create a common ground? And what do you think future holds? I mean, we can all talk about the dark future. We can all talk about the, what uh, Judith talked about in terms of negativity, right? But what about, what about a positive future? And, you know, we're, we're kind of like past our two hours, and uh, we would like to wrap it up too. So it would be, it would be great at least to, to like end on some positive notes. Can response. Oh, we also have another response. I, I'll talk. You, you answer your question. I'll, I'll get get to this afterwards. Go ahead. Can I respond to the the points that were just made? Um, you're right that I mean, in terms of polls of uh, Israeli Jews in the working class, uh, an overwhelming majority of them support the current actions um, or the operation that just took place in Gaza. Um, in terms of forging some kind of alternate universality uh, or, or some kind of basis from which to, to politically uh, resolve the current impasse, um, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical. Uh, I'm not sure, I mean there's usually, there are various uh, formulas that are usually concocted to try to explain why the working class of different nations doesn't unite. Um, one, of the, one of those explanations is that um, the Israeli working class has simply been bought off by the spoils of empire, by um, the extraction of raw materials and, uh, and, and uh, super profits. This is uh, the, the Leninist imperialist model. Uh, I, I'm personally skeptical of that. Um, I think it's just um, 
incredibly, incredibly intense nationalism, um, not, not with any kind of labor aristocracy basis. But I, I'm not sure what other political entity really would be capable of pressuring, uh, pressuring the Israeli government to stop what it's doing. Because, I mean, really, like, I mean, the U.S. is not going to cut off aid. I mean, if we're being realistic. Um, I'm personally skeptical about the viability of, of BDS, even if it seems to be a kind of central node around which to organize um, uh, solidarity for Palestinians. Um, I'm not sure, you know, aside from the kind of liberal, moral, humanitarian intervention that could be prompted by something by, like the UN or the United States coming in and stopping what's going on, the violence there. Um, I'm not sure whether there could actually, I mean, that would be the liberal solution that Michael talked about. I mean, I'm not sure whether national liberation in the kind of classical Marxist sense, the Leninist sense, can really be the basis of uh, lib the emancipation of Palestinians. I'm not, I just don't know what kind of force that they have by themselves. I mean, they're disarmed, I mean, or massively unevenly matched. I'm very, um, I'm very pessimistic about the future. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Uh, should I respond to the? Or, okay. Why don't you go ahead? Well, yeah. if, if you if you can somehow combine my question and respond to them, because we also have a statement from Fernando Castro Flores from Spain, which I would like to read and end the night with. So it'd be great if we can like get your response and then see if there's more questions on the floor here and then go to Professor Flores's statement and then and then end the night. Uh, sorry, you're speaking to me? Yes, yes, okay. I'm speaking to Alex. Okay. Um, I mean, to be honest, and maybe it doesn't come out from what I'm saying or how I'm speaking, but I, I am actually quite optimistic uh, in certain ways, despite the incredible horrific violence we've seen over the last 30, uh, 30 days and obviously the less spectacular violence that preceded it. Um, I mean, regarding the topic of BDS, um, not to sound like a fanboy of the movement, but um, to be honest, I, I would say that um, it has been the only strategy I think that we can recall in recent memory that has actually made this, um, you know, a recurring movement that does not only happen when Gaza is being bombed, that this is not only on people's consciousness when Gaza is being bombed. Um, and it has, like you said, it provided a note of organizing. But at the same time, I think in terms of when you said, I don't think it's realistic for the U.S. to cut off funding, I agree with that, but I also don't think that's the goal of BDS. The goal of BDS is, um, I mean, to act in ways that the Palestinian Solidarity Movement has, has been unable to until this point, which is in terms of massively sort of creating a node of action for grassroots movements around the world to organize, to act, um, and to, you know, specifically, I mean, if you want to talk about raising awareness, raise awareness, but also to force companies particularly in this liberal age of uh, corporate responsibility, to react. Um, and, and I think they have done that in an incredible way over the last, um, you know, the last few years. But I want to also point out and mention that I don't think it's just BDS. If, if I, I think what the question that Mohammed just asked about the future and how this is going to be resolved, and, and this is not me advocating or, or anything, but it's kind of the only, the only hope I see at this point, is one, BDS from the outside, and two, armed and unarmed resistance from the inside. Um, as I mean, as Hamas has overwhelmingly showed, the only way to get Palestinian suffering noticed is to resist in an armed way. At the same time, the, not unarmed, the unarmed resistance, which is the vast majority of the resistance in Palestine that we're talking about, um, has also captured the world's attention. But I think the unarmed resistance does not capture any attention in Israel. You can slaughter as many Palestinians in the West Bank for no reason as you want, and it doesn't matter in Israel. The Israeli public doesn't give a shit. It's only when there are rockets falling on Israel that it's actually, that they remember that there are Palestinians that even exist. Um, and I think that's, this is definitely a post-Oslo moment that we're talking about in terms of the complete disconnection of the Israeli public from Palestinians in any way possible. Lack of interaction, even as employers of Palestinians, is not something that we see anymore. Um, and, and if it wasn't for Hamas's rockets, there would be no awareness in Israel about what the hell was going on. Um, or even the fact that there is a blockade. I mean, that's one of the craziest things over the last two weeks is that Hamas has repeated the word blockade every single day 20 times, and the UN is admitting that there's a blockade for the first time in how many years, and the Israeli public is having a discussion about why, why there's, you know, even if it's supportive of the blockade, at least they know what the hell they're doing. 
Um, and so I think, I mean, and anyone else feel free to jump in here, but for me, those are kind of the three nodes um, that, that, that provide some possible hope of a solution. Let me, let me, let me ask a sp about a specific practice um, to, to really anyone um, who's in Palestine right now. There was a, a moment when it was very difficult for the state inside the entity to get rid of collective farming um, done by groups of Palestinians in order to try and establish um, sort of commons, right, old-fashioned common land, um, so, such as Al-Masha. Um, and I wonder if there's any viability left in that kind of technique as a sort of nonviolent form of resistance that would be part of a diversity of tactics. I mean, I'm... I'm willing to respond to that. I mean, in the last, and, and Khaled or anyone else, feel free to jump in at any moment. Um, but in the last two years, there have been two different attempts, Bebe Shams and the Hejla, um, in which hundreds of people went to like areas within the West Bank where there was no settlement and where there was no Palestinian uh, village or anything to speak of, which is technically Palestinian public land that was passed through the Ottoman Code and which is considered public land for West Bank Palestinians um, and set up tents basically which was part of a larger movement which with inside Israel um, in, in, in 1948 Palestine you had Palestinians who were refugees but who still remained inside Palestine uh, within the borders of what became Israel, going and putting tents in their former villages from that they were kicked out of 60, 65 years ago. Um, and it was part of a broader issue uh, of nonviolent basically creation of Palestinian settlements. That was the idea, is that if we can claim this land, then they can't put a settlement on top of the land. Um, and, I mean, unfortunately, it was a... Um, I don't want to say it's a complete failure, but in the sense of capturing the world's attention, zero. In, the, in, the, in, the, in terms of capturing Israeli the Israeli public's attention, zero. In terms of, I mean, outside of the West Bank and the Palestinian Solidarity Movement, I don't know who heard about it. Um, and this was the, the one of the saddest, you know, things about watching it is that you're watching people do exactly what the world says Palestinians need to do, and then the next day they get, you know, taken away by uh, Israeli bulldozers, uh, and, and no one has anything to say about it. So un unfortunately, I'm I'm somewhat pessimistic about that one. So, guys, so I think I think we should try to like get some other see if anybody here has anything to add or say because. Uh, We've been dominating the discussion among sort of like plan people and semi-plan people like Ross, who just messaged me early on. I said I'm coming down to say a few words, and I said sure you can join us. <laughs> Anybody here has any questions or they want to address address the address the topic? Okay, you you want to if you come here, then you get, so then say it loud so it gets on a microphone and then other people hear it too. Uh, I just wanted to say for anyone who's here, I'm one of the curators of the New Museum show. If you have any questions about it, I'd be happy to talk to you. What, you're one of the curators of the New Museum show? Yeah. Thanks for coming down to our to our rather critical event. I see what's stirred up some discussion. <laughs> so, yeah, so. Uh, I think I think Juan wants to introduce <laughs> Fernando Castro Flores. Yeah, um, Fernando Castro Flores normally doesn't need any introduction in most of the world except New York City, where he only curated twice at White Box uh, in Chelsea. Yep, but um, I mean he has too many titles. He's a professor of aesthetics um, and ethics at the Universidad Complutense in Madrid. A curator of over a hundred shows, several uh, biennials, and so forth. And the lately, as an enfant terrible, um, um, and lately, when I was in Madrid two weeks ago, curating uh, Karol Schneemann, um, he presented his last book, The Art and Economics in the Age of the Global Ripoff. Uh, things a magnificent, illustrious mind who tried to be um, part of this panel, and he is, in the fact that Mohammed's going to read his last thoughts at the foot of the Sierra in Spain without any coverage, at a little old-fashioned uh, telephone, he had to type three, one letter out of three pulses, it's the only thing he would get any signal. So here comes Fernando Castro Flores in absentia.
Tonight I need to speak or rather write about what is happening in Gaza beyond any academic or specialized discourse, leaving behind all pretense of objectivity in trying to be fair in front of a reality beyond traumatic. I must propel my thinking from, a, from the inner core of pure indignation, given that what we have at hand is just a tremendous image of injustice. The State of Israel is employing a criminal strategy and is perpetrating slaughter. Indiscriminate bombing is offering the world indiscriminate killings. And the new planetary scene is that of hospitals, schools, and houses reduced to cinders. Corpses popping up everywhere and people suffering this horror. While this atrocious and despicable process of extermination of the Palestinian people is carried on, we cannot remain silent or take cynical positions. Violent crime forces us today once more to establish a common front of world citizens who unite their critical and creative power to demand an end to the slaughter. Praise to great thought today is found only in the voices that proclaim no. We are obligated morally and politically in the noble scene of politics as the art of the distance vis-a-vis -vis the global systematization of the corrupt to intervene against Israel's military criminal intervention. Today, we can only stand beside the Palestinian people without falling into the deception of pretending to be the voice of their pain and rage. We must raise our thinking to, paradoxically, imagine what happened at the ground level, the Palestinian people being reduced to the condition of corpses and ruins. We cannot take refuge in the aesthetics or in the rhetoric of complaint. There is no room left to sublimation and horror is not yet a moment of the sublime. The whole world is witnessing the imposition of a sinister massacre, only too familiar and re-mirrored into the unimaginable limits, being served to us in the narcotic cocktail of information that privileges the compassionate spectacle or compassionate spectacle. We can no longer wait for everything to be settled as if there was still some kind of magic left somewhere. Today's history is not despite Marx's inversion, a, for, a farce. Contrary, it inhabits the condition of tragedy where only the unjust reigns. My poor words, slowly written on a cell phone, are only meant to add my pen to the common voice of folk, folk again, who demand the end to this slaughter in Gaza. To think today is only to reclaim justice in this wasteland Surrounded by demolished houses, bombed schools, and hospitals, we are made keenly aware that we cannot remain silent when crime alone imposes its unjust law. Today, all committed thinking regarding Gaza must be an open page from where to raise our voice and demand peace. So that was Fernando Castro Flores. You know, as someone who attended your opening, the night of the opening, I was invited to the, to, the, to the opening of the show. I was appalled by the atmosphere of celebration that was all over the museum, the liquor sponsorship and the party. While Palestinians were being slaughtered in Gaza, New York and the elite of the Arab world of New York and the artists were all gathered together in a museum to celebrate the culture of the Arab world and the fifth floor exhibition of Palestine. And you know, a few nights before that, in Taymor Gallery, there was an exhibition organized by uh, Molly Kleiman of, uh, of the Triple Canopy and, and one of my one of my friends, they curated together a show, and we were discussing, and we were all speculating that someone at the new museum opening will do something, will throw a banner, will say something. And what I saw there was silence. And the Arab artists at the show were almost embarrassed of the Gaza war, as if this was just this inconvenience war that had just taken place to ruin their party. And nobody wanted to say something. And you know this 
famous silence equal death slogan. I'm sorry, I'm older and I remember those days. Silence equal death was what just occupied my mind. So you know what I did? I just drank. I went upstairs and I drank more. And I went downstairs and I drank more. And I just drank myself out and I was like, I think I would want to do something about this. So I hope that our critical lens towards the exhibition and this experience hasn't really like uh, left a bad taste in your mouth. But really. What's interesting is that you're really looking at in the exhibition and the fact is the timing is coincidental. Oh, I said so many times coincidental. Yes, but the way you're reading it in your theoretical framework is such that they, it supposes a common board. Well, but can we can we deny the fact that a show like this begin with how Arab Spring unfolded, which we can also talk about how the destruction of Gaza or Hamas has somehow to do with the last end of Arab Spring because because it's only because Muslim Brotherhood was kicked out of power through a coup d'état that then Israel and America decided that it's time to blow a big big hole in Hamas's power structure. So it's really the show began probably. I'm just speculating with some idea of the Arab Spring and then here it is the Gaza war is somehow kind of like encompassing it so it is coincidental but at the same time it's not that coincidental. Well, that's how you're reading it. I don't know what else to say except that for me it's a that the title of the show is of the French left, the intellectual class that's sitting around in their living rooms and talking about the revolution, but not doing a thing. And what are we doing right here? We're drinking beer and talking about I'm Sorry. But no, 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 no. You're you're entitled to your opinion. I'm glad that you. Khaled is not here, and Khaled is not like just drinking beer, sitting around. You know, I mean, he's participating in this conversation as well. Yeah, yes. I just want to make sure that that's clear. But this is how Excuse me. For that time, right there. It's a series. Hello. Is that? She's she's she she's she's stressing that this this is a series of monologues, and it's not a conversation. Which is somehow sort of like, you know, like it's somewhere between a series of monologues and a conversation. But I think it is, it, but you know, I want you to know that like a lot of us who are here and are online have been on an ongoing conversation for the last three weeks on social media about this. And actually this, this whole thing was some, somehow came out of those conversations, even though, even though it appears as a series of monologues. And that's exactly what we aim for. So I can't ask for anything more. And I can't ask that the conversations be not critical either. Of course they should be critical. Yeah, I wish I wish you actually you, you say your name so we would know who actually came and get recorded in our little history here. Sorry, what because Hi Anthony. Natalie. 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 Hello. Got Natalie Bell in the house. Can I call? Hey, can Mo. I speak? Mo? Yes. I think we have a response. Uh, who have wants a response? response? Me, 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 me. I'm here. Hello. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Hi, Natalie. Thank you for coming. Uh, I will. I will say something like, uh, for me, the the show in the new museum. It was when I had the artist talk and uh, I got my point and. Uh, the discussion and the Q and A in the artist talk was very important. I don't know how was the celebrity of the hello. You hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. I don't know how it was the celebrity of the show, but I believe that people in Gaza they have the the power to celebrate the born of a new four babies while the killing of the of more than three five hundred uh, three hundred fifty children, so the people also then they have the right to celebrate. We can't prevent people from celebration, and we was celebrating sometimes in the West Bank while we have all this uh, slaughtered in Gaza and in the West Bank. 
because this is our way of resistance, this is our way of continuing our life. This is what the occupation want to take from us. They want to take from us our spirit, our smile, and this is the, the, the mental occupation that they are trying to do and they are not succeeding with. When, when they stop me in the bridge, the Israeli army, they accept us to accept our defeat by silence. They don't want, we are not allowed to express ourselves. We are not allowed to even discuss. We are not allowed even to ask why you are sending me back. So I, didn't, I was not discussing them. I said I will not go back. I, I brought small papers, white papers, and I made an abstract shape on the floor. So I was kind of drawing with this paper on the floor. Suddenly, four security came to surround me and it was a dangerous act for them. And they were talking to me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. What is this? I said, nothing. This is just a stupid uh, game, stupid, uh, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's mean nothing. Then they called, they called the head of security, and the head of security he came to me. And he was asking, what is this? I said, it's an abstract shape. Are you afraid from this? He said, no, but you need to tell me why you do this. I said, this is not the question. The question is that you need to ask yourself why you stop me from leaving my country to go to pick up my flight from Amman to New York. I have flight to New York in four hours. And you are stopping me from following my, from catching my, my flight to New York. This is the question. What I did here is, is, is the way to get a, a message. It's the way to get this discussion. When he found that his discussion is useless, he didn't even say anything. He just left me with nothing. So this was my suppression that I have, I, I, I raised my voice. And I told you, as, a, as an artist, I have the privilege to tell the story of the other people that they didn't succeed. It's, it's OK. I will. I will travel, like even some of the Israelis themselves, they were trying to help me. Everybody is trying to help me to travel again. But they were not, never, never been trying to help the other people, the normal pe the, the people who's like going to visit their families. I missed the art show, but I made more than the art show. I was having the artist talk via Skype, and it was succeed. I was there. My voice was there, and this is what's more important. Thank you. So on this note, I think we can just close the session and thanks everyone, including Natalie, for being here. And uh, there's two videos online. I think we might combine them into one for later viewing, but these two will be immediately available if you want to like share them or watch them. or Because the sound on the videos at home, I think, is going to be better than the sound right here. But for some of this discussion, you might want to go rewind it and listen to it because I bet the video will have better sound. Anyways, thanks, Khaled. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Louis George. And also thanks to Tony Yannick, who volunteered to be our technical support person for this long session. If there's no more question, question I think we can close, right? For those who haven't seen actually that speech by Ale Gerard, we're going to turn it on right now. Because I figure half of you have not seen it. It is a devastating piece. Thank you. Okay, Tony, you can kill it. Thanks.